Welcome, everybody, to the Level Up podcast. We've got an amazing episode for you today. I'm Matt Johnson. We've got Greg Harrelson here, and we have the CEO of Century 21, Nick Bailey, is going to join us. We're going to talk about the future of real estate and what agents can do right now to attract more clients. So we've got a bunch of stuff to get into today. I know this is going to be a pretty wide-ranging conversation, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be punchy. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn a lot about what Nick has and what he's seeing on the horizon, but we're also going to talk about just some practical things that agents can be doing right Right now to prepare for the changes that are coming. So first of all, Greg Harrelson. Hey, I'm excited oh, to be Lord, here. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm doing great. Excited to be here. Um, very excited to have this conversation with uh, with Nick. I've had a few conversations with him in the past and heard him speak many times and uh, love what he has to say. Um, and if we do our job right, Matt, we'll pull out some information out of him that uh, will, might change the entire industry right here in this little 30 minute episode. <laughs> That's right. No Love pressure, it. Nick, by the way. Yeah, Welcome. thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Matt, Craig, it was going to be nice to be with you, but forget it. That's right. <laughs> Nick is currently diving out of the window that's to his left right now. That's yes. right. But, uh, Nick, for anybody that hasn't been paying attention, you are the, the newly named CEO of Century 21. Give us an idea of your background and, and how you got to be where you're at. Yeah, first off, thanks for having me. And, and uh, you say newly, believe it or not, I've hit the seven-month mark. Mm -hmm. um, so it still feels new in some ways, but not in others. Uh, quick background, yeah, so I started real estate at 17 buying commercial property, um, two retail buildings, and at 18 bought my first house because I didn't think it made sense to pay rent to live in a dorm, um, and that was my forte into real estate. Got licensed at 21, ironically started with Century 21 at 21 years old, and went through the uh, process of selling real estate as an agent, had a partner that uh, we opened an office together, uh, then I went to one of the major franchise brand networks in the country and was there for 11 and a half years before going to the consumer and tech side, uh, which led me to Market Leader Truly and Zillow Group through that acquisition funnel. And then ironically, seven months ago, which was 21 years to the day later, was announced in this role. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that there are a lot of 21s in my past that have led me here. Crazy, love it. That's awesome. All right. So uh, so we've got a bunch of stuff to get into. Uh, the one thing that really stood out when we were preparing to have you on the show, Nick, is we, you know, the conversation that we really want to get to is kind of where are things going? Where do you see things? You know, what, what are the assets that you see that a company like Century 21 has to take with them into the future? But uh, at the at the core of it always is kind of the consumer experience and the agent. So tell us a little bit about how uh, some of the tech and online as agents just to attract clients better and deliver them a better experience? Yeah, I think that's a great question to start with, Matt, because here's what we know so far is with the online and technology space, it creates a lot of confusion for agents. And we have what's important to agents and brokers, and we have what's important to buyers and sellers. We also have everything outside of real estate that's influencing our lives. And so I've said for many months that we're in a consumer-driven movement right now. And what I mean by that is Let's use Amazon as a crazy example. If you would have asked how many years ago, the idea of having your credit card online and you pick a product and you do a single swipe to buy and it's delivered in two days, you think it's crazy. Now what's crazier than that is where is that the retail world going? Uh, look at their recent acquisition of Ring, the doorbell. Picture a world where right now, if you ask consumers, Greg, Matt, if you get your Amazon packages delivered, are you okay with the Amazon delivery truck and delivery person opening your front door and putting the package in your house and then leaving, I bet that probably leaves you with some unsettling comfort. Most right. people say, no way is the Amazon driver going to enter my house. Fast forward a world, I predict in retail, um, two, three years from now, we will feel better about the Amazon delivery being dropped off and secure in our home than we do leaving it on the porch today. And it reminds me of online banking 20 years ago. And people said, no way am I going to online banking. Um, and now can you imagine a world without it? And so the same thing's happening in real estate. Consumers are driving the bus. And the more we recognize it, the faster we can respond to it. And what I mean by that is because of technology around us, processes and experiences that we have as consumers, they're demanding that in real estate as well. And what's fortunate is that there's opportunity and what I mean by that is when you ask most buyers and sellers after they leave the closing table, do you want to buy or sell anytime again soon? And what do the vast majority of them say? No. Um, the process was complex. It was confusing. It created anxiety. And so that's where we have the opportunity to utilize technology to do a better job. 
we've seen that in the industry in the last decade with home search. Mm -hmm. And um, everyone knows what I mean by home search and the different third parties that are out there. That home search is only this big a, a sliver. That's the fun part. I like to call it the sexy part. But then when you get a, a person that goes home shopping to close, that is real estate. And that's the process that's still really clunky. Um, the average transaction from deciding you want to get um, into buying or selling has 181 steps to close. And so we have an opportunity to leverage technology to help make that process a better experience for buyers and sellers. Let, let me let me touch on something. So going back to the um, our willingness over time, will it sounds like, and I do agree that if you ask me if I'm okay if Amazon comes in the door today, I'm like, my my first reaction was not really, but I know I'm going to be. You know, it's like I I, <laughs> I I know I'm going to be. It's like I just haven't quite accepted it right yet. Um, but I think that touches on a whole nother uh, conversation that's going on that's very confusing right now to consumers, and that is the conversation around data. And then we, you know, we we look at Facebook, and they had the breach of data uh, that there's that's been all over the news, and it really freaks people out, you know. And, and and I find it fascinating that I kind of already know that they're listening to me, and that they're watching me, and the technology can already is already exists that if I take a selfie and it happens to have a a uh, a steak in the background, that I'm probably going to get served up some ads, you know, from this uh, steakhouse. I, exactly. I, I get it, right? Um, but I, I can also see that I don't feel like everyone's quite there to just go ahead and admit that data is influencing so many decisions that we're making. What is your kind of take on data, and, 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 and how do we stay on the forefront of the data conversation? Because I see that technology and data is going to move faster than the willingness of the industry or maybe individuals in the industry. Mm -hmm. So what are some changes, some adaptations that we as real estate professionals need to start considering in order to be on the forefront? So number one, it reminds me of a panel I was on five years ago and we were talking about data, 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 data in real estate. Who owns the data? And it's the agent that gets the listing, but it's the homeowner's property, but yet the listings belong to the broker. Everyone knows the conversation. I said five years ago, we are on the back nine of the data conversation. And I had a CEO of a CRM that was sitting in the room and raised his hand adamantly and said, no, you're crazy. This is the beginning of data. Here's what I know is today, we should not be worrying about who has the data because it's everywhere and it's accessible. And quite honestly, if you look at the data around real estate, it always existed at the courthouse even 40 years ago. Anyone could go look it up, but you had to manually go and flip through the pages. So the data has always been there. It's just now how it's readily available. The stage that we're in today is how are people leveraging the data and using it to provide experiences for consumers. So just like your staking analogy and getting something from Del Frisco's or Morton's or something the next day as a coupon, um, the concept being that is it going to make your life easier? And if you like great steakhouses, do you appreciate getting that? And so there is some creepiness behind Big Brother, which is what it is. And at the same time, I think there is a potential risk in everything that we have in life. I drive my car today, but I know that there's a percentage risk that something could happen to me when I drive my car. I fly in airplanes all the time. I know that there's a low percentage risk of something happening. The same thing happens with data. We can't be hermits, lock ourselves in our houses, um, never touch a computer, never have online banking. That's just not the world that we're living in today. So I think that we should embrace data on how we serve it up to consumers to create a better experience for them. Um, yeah, we need to be safe about it, of course, but there is going to always be a level of risk. But where we're moving to me in the next couple of years is not who has the data or who owns it or writes, it's who's gonna use it and how are they gonna use it. And that's what I think we're gonna see next. And it's gonna come in, a, let me give you a specific. Um, we're starting to see a lot about predictive analytics. I think that in the next 24 to 36 months is going to be where a lot of agents dump a lot of money, um, just like whatever new shiny object happens out there. Do they track ROI necessarily? Some are good at it. Some could be better at it. Um, but it does have some relevance. I was talking with a company just a few weeks ago. They have 1,800 data points on every home in the major markets that they're currently in that will predict whether or not someone will list in the next six months. I looked at it and said, are there really 1,800 data points for you to have on my particular home and me? And the answer is yes. And so I think that we're going to see 
better usage of predictive analytics versus just spending tons of money on data and marketing to everyone. It's kind of the um, do it with a scalpel, not a chainsaw. And I think there's going to be really interesting things that come out of it, but there will be a lot of messiness in the process. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things some uh, some of the people in, in my circles have been talking about is like the future of lead generation. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of it has been um, you convert once you've identified, you know, uh, you've identified a lead. Maybe you did an outbound prospecting call. You identified a lead and then you work on conversion that the real game seems to be. Um, or in the future, as we're, we're believing, is that it's going to be how do we identify the opportunities before the consumer themselves have actually made the decision. So it's not about waiting for them to us. Uh, it's not about waiting to get a lead from Zillow. It's about how are we engaging using data and, and predictive analytics to get into a relationship before they actually ever go to Zillow. And so you've touched on something that I think is important. There is a lot that has changed in the industry, but there's just as much that has not. And this is what people don't talk about is at the end of the day, real estate professionals are looking for someone that wants to buy or someone that needs to sell. And it's the process and how we identify who those people are before somebody else does in order to attract them as a client. We grab them and then we take them through a very similar process that's happened for decades. So that brings us to, here's a great real time example. Um, used to be 20 years ago, you went to a neighborhood party and you knew that so-and-so unfortunately was getting divorced. Chances are you're an agent or a friend, you engaged with them and they might be selling their home. Unfortunate circumstance, but realistically, that is a life trigger that, oh, by the way, predictive analytics look at today in terms of um, divorce rates, average time being married, um, filings, that is one component that predictive analytics use. And so now it's a matter of, can we identify it through data versus the neighborhood party to maybe engage in those people with the same subject? And I think the answer is gonna be yes. And it's going to be able to be served up to us in a manner that's very easy. But agents that have always relied on sitting there waiting for the phone to ring or the lead to come in will always be waiting for leads. Those agents that go out and prospect in the manner in which consumers are engaged will find people that want to buy and sell. You have to, it's a contact sport. Prospecting is 100% a contact sport. And I always tell people, they say, where should I spend my money? Should I buy leads from certain companies or not? I say, go where the consumers are. 20 years ago, if you could be invited to a room of 500 to work it or a room of five, where would you go? Obvious answer. So the same thing applies today in the tech environment is go where consumers are and engage with them. And there will be life situations that cause them to want to buy or sell and you will be the person that grabs them as a, as a client right. or as an agent. Yeah, so, so touching on technology, or, uh, well, we've been on technology for a little while, but I'm hearing agents, um, you know, in the field right now, uh, on the ground level, starting to identify themselves not as being real estate agents, but being marketing agents, um, meaning that they think that my, you know, they're, and whether or not it's just a sexy spin that they're trying mm -hmm. to put on uh, a, a label to say, hey, this is what I do for you when you hire me. But then you start to hear companies saying that we're technology companies. We got agents saying that we're marketing agents. It seems like we're getting away from calling ourselves real estate companies and real estate agents or being in the real estate business. I've heard you kind of speak on that a little bit uh, in the past, but can you just kind of open up a dialogue and give us your thoughts on who are we, who, who should we be, and who does the consumer want us to be? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, and um, this came out in our conference um, at our C21, uh, 121 yeah. experience just a few weeks ago, because I get asked this a lot. I think that real estate professionals have always had, at times, an identity crisis, because there's so many facets to the business. I was one. I was doing my own marketing. I had seven closings one month, and what did I do? I went and bought billboards because my ego said I, I should, not because the ROI on buying billboards should. Um, and, and so, but I was a marketing expert. Um, I also had to be a negotiation expert. Um, I also had to leverage what technology at the time, which was a phone and a fax machine. Um, but, and I had to leverage those things for, for my business. So there are, will always be components because we have a multifaceted organization or industry that you will have to engage in all those components. But here's what I announced that I know. We are in the real estate business, which we are in the business of helping people buy and sell real estate, period. 
At least that's what our company is in for. We help people buy and sell real estate. And to do so, we will leverage marketing, we will leverage technology and all the necessary components that create an extraordinary experience for buyers and sellers to do that. Got it. So we're in the real estate business. And it, and, and I, I would imagine the consumer, you know, I, I'm just trying to make my own logic out of this. It seems like the consumer still wants us to help them buy and sell, meaning they, they must make assumptions that we're going to be uh, efficient at using the right technologies and creating the best experience for them. I, I think, because I don't see that as being a conversation that the consumers bring into the agent. I see that as being a conversation that the agent uses to sell um, you know, the consumer. I think the consumer, and, and I believe you believe it also, still demands and, and requests that we do the job of helping somebody buy or sell, period. Now, how we do it, mm -hmm. how we do it is why they hire us. It's like the doctor. They go to the doctor to get better. Now, how the doctor gets them better is not nearly as important as them making sure that they get better. So I love the fact that... Um, you gave a great analogy on the physician thing. So here's what happened. It used to be you got a cough or you got sick, you went to the doctor to find out what it was and then they treated you. Today, what do we do as consumers? We go on WebMD, we diagnose ourselves, we print it out, we walk into the doctor's office and say, hey doc, I have this, I need a prescription for that. Do you not think that that drives physicians crazy? The same thing <laughs> happens today with consumers in real estate. Hey Greg, I found this house, will you show it to me? Um, and then they question, are you worth your commission? Here's two things that I know. Um, around data to use for where we're at is one, FISBOs since NAR's been tracking them, tracking them in the early 80s are the lowest they've ever been. And they are lowest in the millennial demographic, which last year 42% of first time home buyers, um, or 42% uh, of buyers were first time home buyers, 72% of them were under the age of 37. And they have the lowest FISBO um, statistic behind them they are using more real estate agents than any other generation prior. And so we have FISBOs that are very, very low. We also have commission rates that are, are essentially unchanged in the last two decades. And so the two of those things are great data points to say, consumers are saying, we value you, we want to be involved in our own research in the process, which is how we are in life now, we have access to data, we will be involved, but we bring a very relevant service to the business. There's an exception to that which is as long as we as the National Association of Realtors is a membership driven business with low barriers of entry, it will allow for mediocrity to exist. And so the consumer doesn't necessarily get the same experience along the way with a uh, part-time producer versus a top producer. And at the same time, 70% of consumers go with the first agent they meet. And so that's the conversation we've been talking about a lot um, in the last few months. Um, like with our new mission statement, to defy mediocrity and deliver extraordinary experiences. And that's what we want to do with the industry. But if the industry doesn't set the standard, how can we? Now, someone may say listening to this, yeah, but that's what everybody says. Um, but I firmly believe that if we can engage with consumers from home shopping to close and create a better experience with how they want it created, the consumers, not necessarily agents. Lead flow is a great example. Agents don't always love how lead flow happens. Listing agents, great example. They want the lead on their uh, listing to come in and they want first stab at it even if they don't get to it in, in, in an hour. What does the consumer say when they say, um, can I see this property or does it have a pool? They are not interested in it if the listing agent's waiting an hour to get back to them. They want an answer now. And so this is an identity crisis that brokers have. Do they satisfy their listing agents and let leads sit in queue for an hour? Or do they put on the consumer hat that says, if we deliver an extraordinary experience to the consumer, which is respond in 60 seconds, is there an opportunity to pop, possibly capture the business? And that's where I think that we are moving from uh, a conversation that needs to happen to be more about the consumer and less about what we want within the industry, because the more we listen to the consumer, that's what will change our behavior on how we use tech communication tools and services to help them. Got it. Yeah, doing? that's 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 great. You know, I've been been uh, training a lot of agents in my office, and I keep telling them, I'm like, you know, I'm a big skill guy. I really believe in skills and scripts and and understanding the the conversation. But I've told them, it's it's a race to the lead. It's speed to lead. 
For well, sure. no, Greg, it's your skill. I said, look, if you don't win the race to the lead, your skills are irrelevant. But when you win the race to the lead and you have skills, mm-hmm. now the game becomes really fun. But it all comes down to speed. It seems to be coming just as important, if not more important, than skill. But that doesn't mean skill. We can we can forget about it. It's just right. that you have the best skills in the world. If you're not in communication because you lost the the, uh, the race to the lead, it's irrelevant. So you mentioned two key things. You were talking speed to lead and then the actual skill of the response. I kind of have a saying for that, that the quality of the lead is determined by the quality of the response. Right. Quality yeah. of the lead is determined by the quality of the response, and that involves timing, it involves information. So let's give the audience a, um, a tip, which is um, go out there, and, and I do it all the time. I, I do sample uh, inquiries on different platforms constantly uh, because I love to see the responses from agents. I can go out and I can inquire on the same property five different ways, and I'll get four emails, two emails, one call, five texts, and people think that they're being really creative by their language that they're using um, in their text message, but it doesn't stand out. It's the sea of sameness. If I get five text messages, it doesn't matter what it says. However, if I get a video that says, hey, Greg, it's Nick over here at C21. I understand you inquired on 123 Elm Street. Happy to set up a showing, and oh, by the way, I can show you any other property you're interested in. Um, And flip your phone around. We all know how to do selfies, but hit the video button instead of the camera button and send that to them. Make it personalized in video. That is a new way. I have had agents come back and say, cannot believe the engagement difference. I was having lunch with someone yesterday that said, I tried it. I was trying to get to this consumer. They wouldn't answer the phone. They wouldn't answer an email. They wouldn't answer a text. And I finally used, they were using BombBomb um, for a video provider, sent them a video and said, hey, here's what's up. They said literally in less than five minutes, the consumer responded to them. And so quality of the response is we have to differentiate, but we have to be willing to do it how consumers want, which consumers are engaging heavily in video. But why won't agents do it? Because less than 5% of them do. I don't like how I sound on camera. I don't like how I look on camera. Um, It's our own self insecurities that are creating us from engaging with the way consumers want. Um, And and so that's just a great example of people that are looking for a trick, do video and respond to leads in less than 60 seconds. And I guarantee that it will change the quality of the response that you get from that lead that's generated. That's a great tip, great tip. Yeah, I hope all my agents start using that immediately. So what about Amazon? You know, everyone's waiting now. Okay, Amazon, let us sign up and be a kind of, I think we maybe be registering to be a potential future person they may recommend to us. Are they going to get into the lead portal business, the referral business? They sure do have the attention. You think of Zillow, you know, and and how much money that companies like Realtor.com and and, and that have actually – put out and invested to get attention and Amazon already has the audience. It's like they just bootstrap one little, little widget onto the, into their system. And all of a sudden they're in the game. Where do, where do big companies that have a lot of attention on them already, how do, are they going to pop up somehow in the equation in the future? And I'm not really asking specifically on Amazon. It's just the hot topic right now is Amazon, but they have a big audience. Um, they they seem to be very trusted amongst their 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 ecosystem. Why couldn't they just get into the business and play some role? What is your take on that? What is what do you hear? Yeah, history repeats itself. Let's go back to when banks were getting in the industry, and the industry freaked out, and there was a ton of noise around it for several years. And I always had the thought at the time I was selling real estate at the time, and I said I would love for my local bank to get into real estate because I could kick their butt. I mean, at the time. Have you ever gotten great customer service from your bank? I mean, at the time, I mean, it's <laughs> a lot of it's changed. So I'm not here to beat up on banks. Don't get me wrong. But gosh, at the same time, you couldn't get them to answer the phone and you stood in line to make a deposit. And I mean, it was rough. And so I went, wow, if they want on my business, bring it um, because I can outservice them. And we're in a customer service business, um, especially today. Used to be I held the MLS books around me and said, I own the data. I will control you as the consumer. I will tell you what's listed. I will tell you if you can see it. And, and I owned that process. Well, today consumers own that entire process. My job is to create wonderful service for them to get them to the closing table because it's tough. I don't believe houses are going to be in a shopping cart. 
I, I, I just really don't. They always have been for an investors. Um, we buy ugly houses. If people remember those billboards, they've been around for a long time. Some of those folks are today the I buyer or the click to buy. Those groups have always bought chunks of real estate sight unseen where they want to rent them or buy them. I don't believe that applies to the masses that are looking to make a huge emotional decision. So how can they leverage their audience to engage in our business? Could they? Yes. However, being in the real estate business is a relationship service driven industry where you are face to face with a buyer or seller and walking them through, hand holding them a very complex process. That means they have to get in our business all the way and sit side by side and, and compete with us in that process. That is an entirely different business model from propping up online marketing and advertising. And so it seems to be that that's, that's part of the reason I took this job, by the way, is because there's so much noise in the industry of what every company that has a few bucks to rub together and a big audience could do. And at the same time, going back to consumers are telling us in two ways. They're using us more than ever before, and they're willing to pay us the same amount that they have over the last couple of decades, um, which indicates we do have great value. If either one of those change, yeah, then that could be a different story. But could some of these big companies leverage their audience in different ways um, to create different opportunities for lead gen? Yes. Going back to your stake analogy, uh, let's say that that came through Amazon, that you got a um, whatever type of grill um, because they know you like steaks and could they say oh really you're interested in buying a new grill you must own a new, a new home let me create a lead gen so I think it we would see it more in a lead generation model than an actual licensee model of face to face belly to belly with the consumer and here's one thing that also hasn't changed is the infrastructure around license law and that's one that no one ever talks about as well to be a real estate professional, I still have to go to my state and get a license and test for it, spend time, become a broker. And until that totally changes, um, any company that wants to be in our business, truly in our business as a licensee, will have to set, their, set themselves in the exact same position and standards as us. But just having a website and consumer audience um, doesn't necessarily mean they have a license to do everything that we do. You know, one of the things that I hope the audience is hearing that because I, I just see multiple times you, you keep coming back to it in one way or another. I, I really hope the audience pulls out that, you know, there is a lot of noise in our industry. We all know that. And, and sometimes that noise is misunderstood. We don't understand the noise. We don't know what tune and what it's supposed to sound like. So then we get fear. Fear right. sets in. But you're just really making it clear that if we will just stay in our lane, which is servicing the consumer, creating fantastic experiences, that's, that's a broad statement. There's many aspects of, of, of how you execute on that. But if we just stay focused on providing real estate services, providing that great experience, it, you, all this chaos can be going on around us and we could still be building our businesses big, bigger than ever. It's just one of the things I'm really taking out of your communication. Well, and I think we also have to not get too caught up in where some of our business comes from, because that's where I hear a lot of the noise. I still believe that repeats, referrals, and sphere um, for a successful agent are super important. And that leads me into like ratings and reviews. So, it, and I always compare things, as you can see from years past, because trying to present History sometimes repeats itself and what's different today that's um, changed in the industry. But here's one is ratings and, re ratings and reviews. And this is not just real estate, but it's all the way around us. For real estate agents, number one reason that they don't do ratings and reviews or engage is because they're afraid of a bad one. But yet, if you look at research shows that perfect star ratings, consumers generally don't believe. So if you go out and look at a, I, I always tell the story about a new lawnmower a few summers ago, and um, everyone that was a perfect five star, eh, I don't know, the ones that were four, eight, four, nine, and had way more reviews, I believed more. Um, and, and so the same thing happens with real estate agents, but here's the key. Consumers are willing to go online and believe what a perfect stranger has to say about, Greg, your service, and will make a decision to engage with you versus what your neighbor says about you or what you say about you. 
And that's the world we're living in in consumers because whether we buy retail, whether it's how we decide to go to pick a restaurant um, or how we select our real estate agent, people are looking at what others say about you because they believe that that third party um, endorsement that is not clouded is a more realistic picture of the service that they will receive. And so I tell real estate professionals all the time, especially those that are nervous to engage in ratings or in reviews, that is gonna be a huge part of the future because what happens, I get a referral from my neighbor, I don't just call Greg and say, sign me up. I come home and I start to research you. And if all of a sudden you're blank online, you're out. So 20 years ago, the average consumer interviewed one agent. Today, they interview an average of three. And so they're doing their research behind your back. And so you've got to engage in even some of these activities that make you feel uncomfortable and be willing to take the risk, just like we talked about on data or driving your car, take the risk of getting a bad review. And I, I, I coach on this and I tell people, sometimes you get maybe a four star versus a five. One of the best things you can do is respond to it. And I, do, I travel a lot. So I look at restaurants and they say, oh, we had a terrible experience. It was slow service. The food was cold. And then you look and it says, hey, I'm the owner of the restaurant, by the way, I'm so sorry you had a bad experience. Um, last night was Valentine's night, we were slammed, we didn't have enough staff, or someone went home sick. Um, that's not what we're known for, would love to make it up if you give us another chance. I have actually selected um, products and services that have someone respond and explain the situation more so than everything being sparkly and perfect because you know they're engaged in their business. And so I say the same thing to agents when you get a great review, you should be responding to every review. So for um, Greg, you give me five stars, I'm gonna respond and say, you were such a delight to help you and your family, glad your kids found the school district that they wanted. If you have other friends and family that we can create the same experience for, let me know. Put that on the actual good review. But that's where people fall in to say, ooh, I got a perfect review, great, um, I'm good. And so that's when I talk about engagement where the consumers are. Um, so don't be afraid of ratings and review. They're here to stay. They're part of our future. And I think the real estate industry lags behind retail and service, and we can take some lessons from both of them. That's good stuff. So I know um, your time's valuable, so I want to respect that. But I, I have a question um, that I wrote down you know, earlier when we first started, and that is you seem to be a competitive guy, and um, I would imagine that you're not always in the position that you're in because you want a job. I'm assuming that you know you have choices for jobs, um, and you probably choose an area where you can have a major impact. If you know, if we were fast forwarding five, ten years from now, and you're looking back, and you're and and you know, it's kind of one of those things where you pat your own self on the back because you said, "Damn it, I did it. I did it. I made a difference to the industry." What difference are you setting out to make? What do you want to accomplish in wow, this Wow, huge question. It Here is we, a huge one, but I, uh, but, but I know you got it somewhere in you. Here we said we weren't going to prep questions. I wish we would have for that one, so I could have thought about it. Thanks, Greg. I think I'm out of time. i got to go. Um, exactly. Gosh, I don't know. Philosophically, um, I'll tell you, real estate's been in my blood for a long time because I loved the fact of – when I sold real estate, and this is going to sound a little cliche, but I'll, I'll share it with you anyway. You know, when I was 21 selling real estate, that's hard to get trust, people to trust you, especially middle-aged people, because they look at you and think you just graduated from eighth grade. Um, and I found my niche, first-time homebuyers because I could relate, and retired people because they were so proud of a grandson just like you. And they trusted me. And so I realized right then, and, and they were a great audience that people take advantage of, unfortunately, on a regular basis. And it was so cool to know that I could help them. And it was so neat to help people buy a home that thought they were gonna be renters forever. And you help them establish wealth and security and American dream. So that was my first forte. Well, then you fast forward and I get to help people own businesses. Uh, whether you're an agent or whether you own a company, a brokerage, um, I get to help lead that effort. And so to see someone go through their life and say, I could have never owned my own business without the counsel and advice, um, that's pretty rewarding. So I think for me, um, looking back and um, saying, hey, what, do you, what, do you, what does success look like? I think it's just knowing that either as an agent or brokerage, to take the years of experience and be able to share it with others, um, to, to point fingers. I mean, I, you know, I get 
comments. I, I got one um, a few months ago that said, I don't know if you remember me or not, um, but we worked together when I bought my first franchise um, 15 years ago. And I said, of course I remember you. Um, and for, for someone to say, um, I'm now at my third location and blah, blah, we could have never done it without you. Uh, that's to me what is cool about this business. So a little bit cliche, but um, that's kind of how I, I see the success is just being able to share the knowledge. And it's not mine. I get to copycat from the industry. Um, Greg, folks like yourself, you're extremely successful. And so I get to stand with you and talk and say, give me your best two ideas. And then I get to go on a podcast and share them as my own and they're not. Um, and that's what I love about this industry. It's the most cutthroat competitive one, but it's also the most cooperative. Um, so long-winded way. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. And, I don't what, know. Yeah, what I'm kind of gathering though is that you're making a commitment to be to take on a leadership role, to give as much as you can give for the development of others, whether it be developing agents, um, you know, or helping companies to develop their agents, companies being able to expand and take a, a more entrepreneurial approach. I mean, those are the things that I'm kind of pulling out, um, which really takes a lot of leadership. If you're going to be the person that's at the head, that's communicating, hopefully you're communicating for the attention, with the intention of developing others. And that's that's what I'm gathering from what you said. So I appreciate you letting yeah. me catch you off guard a little bit. No, that's I okay. Bet you, I, I bet you you're going to actually answer that question someday in the future, and it's going to be unbelievable. Yeah. How you're thinking about it. I'll have a better answer someday. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I go back to that. That's why I took this job. As, as, as easy as our business is, the industry is complex and noisy. And it's been satisfying even seven months into this role now to say, gosh, tell us about what are portals doing or what are SaaS-based technology companies doing? And so, um, you know, people are usually experts in their field. Top producers are experts at being agents, maybe not owners of companies, maybe owners or companies are not experts in technology. And so that's why I'm just trying to put it together and say, be an agent, a broker, a franchisor, be on the tech and consumer side. And can I help put a bow on that? Um, to create clarity in a noisy space. That's what I'm trying to do with this role now. Fantastic. Matt, yeah, thank you, Greg. Uh, that's, uh, any last uh, yeah, well, questions? Well, I think not, not, not questions because I want to honor next time. But yeah, just yeah. the, so, I mean, the whole theme of the show is going from agent to entrepreneur. And, and Nick briefly touched on something that I'd love to pull out, which is that, Nick, when, when you're in a position like, you're, like you are, and your job is to listen to all the different experts, I mean, one of your key skills and the key skill that any anybody that aspires to be an entrepreneur, if you want to go from an agent to entrepreneur, is to pay attention to this skill. And it's the skill of putting concepts together, right? The ability to think abstractly and pull the principles out of something that some that the information that you're taking in, whether that's in person or things that you read. And Nick, that's where you're like, if you wouldn't be in the position that you're in if you didn't have and develop that skill set. And that's something that we can all work on. I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's something I have to continue to work on every day. But uh, when you're surrounded by really successful people in the industry, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it does not so. Right? <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well, Nick, what are you what are you excited about in the world of Century Twenty One that you'd like to point people to? Uh, is there any any place that you'd like them to go first um, and to just take a step forward, and engage a little bit with with the community? Oh man, super excited! We just a few weeks ago launched all the rebranding. You know, this is a company that attracted me not only did I start there as an agent it's 47 years strong but it's also been around for 47 years which means um, the first brand that introduced the franchise model and so now it's what's the next generation so if people haven't seen it go to rebrand.c21.com and take a look because um, we're looking at how do we create the next generation image brand and mindset it's not just about a logo it's much more I mentioned the new mission statement behind it, and we're really looking at um, how can we leverage the scale of a company that's um, 118,000 agents, 80 countries, 8,000 locations strong, and say this is an amazing scaled organization with number one brand presence, and say what's the future look like? Because a lot of companies that have been around for 47 years talk about the past and all the success they've had in the past. And I'm saying, that's fine, but we can't impact that. All we can do is impact moving forward. And so go to the site, you'll take a look, and it's our first step. I always tell people, fasten your seatbelts for 2018, uh, because we'll be able to use the assets and scale and success of this company to be able to move it forward for the next generation of real estate. And it, it charges me up. Um, our announcement a few weeks ago, I was like a kid in a candy store. It was great. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. 
All right, Greg, and for you, contact, uh, what's the best way to reach out? You know, the best uh, place for the audience to reach out is, uh, you know, is through Facebook Messenger. That's That seems to be the most convenient for me and it help, helps me uh, organize all the uh, questions that come in and I can, you know, answer those at my will and as well as, um, you know, those that are within the Century 21 organization. I'm very active on the uh, Facebook workplace. So, you know, whether you're chatting uh, with me through uh, workplace uh, within Century 21 or you're just going to Messenger, that's uh, the best way to, to reach me. Perfect. All right, guys, and for the podcast itself, make sure to go to iTunes or Stitcher to subscribe to the audio version. You can also go to YouTube and catch the video versions, or you can just like the Level Up page on Facebook, which is where we uh, stream this, one of, the, one of the locations we stream this. But we really, really appreciate, guys, you watching live and anyone that's listening or watching after the fact. And, and Nick, we just want to thank you so much for your time and for your contribution. And uh, this is probably the most unique interview I've ever done with a high-level executive because you are incredibly – candid and authentic and really have nothing to really hold back. So it was a really fun conversation and I think people pull a lot of value from. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. What you see is what you get. Thanks, guys. Thanks. It's been great to be with you. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks, Nick and and Matt. Thank you so much.